this, uh, this, the main goal of this lecture was to show one example of a, a non-autonomous problem for which we can precisely describe what happens to the solution when times go to plus infinity. And uh, we wanted to show that uh, in, in this case, the gradient structure seen in the autonomous case is uh, also present in the non-autonomous case. The main things that we are able to prove so far is uh, that uh, in, you can replace the equilibria by isolated invariant sets for the skew product semigroup that all solutions converge to one of these isolated invariant sets and that uh, everything else that you see in the attractor for the skew product semigroup is connections between these isolated invariant sets and the connections go in the direction of uh, uh, the uh, isolated invariant sets which corresponds to solutions with more zeros to the isolated invariant sets uh, which correspond to solution with the less zeros. Bueno, pues os presento a Esther de Carvalho, que es eh, catedrático de la Universidad de São Paulo. <risa> y bueno, es un experto en sistemas de gran resolución infinita. Y bueno, discípulo directo de Jack Hale, que fue uno de los pioneros de toda esta, toda esta teoría. Y bueno, eh, no voy a decir nada de currículum, simplemente decir que es fuera de serie en Matemático, como matemático, como persona, así que bueno, adelante. Muchas gracias, José, muchas gracias por la uh, presentación, mucho más de que me recogió. <risa> eh, so, eh, en, y, y también muchas gracias por invitarme para venir a Elche, que uh, está siendo un periodo muy agradable aquí esta semana. Este es lo más que voy a decir en español, toda la charla va a ser en inglés, ok. So, uh, this is the title of the lecture, a gradient structure for a non-autonomous shape infante problem. And I would say that this is our most uh, success successful attempt to, uh, in the quest of understanding the forward dynamics of a non-autonomous problem. Right? So, uh, the lecture is divided in three parts, but I think I will not have much time to get into the technical part, which is part two and part three. So I probably be most of the time, or if not all the time, uh, on the setup of the problem, which is um, basically giving you the information needed so I can state the main result. And uh, if I have a little bit of time at the end, I'll go through the techniques that are needed to prove the results. Well, the proofs, uh, it's there too long, I'm not, I'm not able to do that here. Okay, so uh, this is a joint work with uh, Rita Brocci from Universi Universidade Federal de Lavras in Brazil and Jose Valero from here. And we are still working on the problem. This is partial results, right? Okay, so this is the problem. This is what we aim to do. We consider a parabolic problem is a, a scalar parabolic equation in dimension one, right? X varies in the interval zero pi. And the difference uh, with the usual Schaeff-Infante problem is just that uh, we added a beta of t here Beta uh, is, n is not close to a constant, it's a function of time that uh, uh, is defined in R plus, but it's a bounded function and it's strictly positive. So it, it, its values are in the interval, close the interval beta 1, beta 2, which is a sub-interval of the open interval 0 infinite. And it's a globally Lipschitz function. You can relax a little bit this condition, but uh, uh, I'm not going to get into these techniques, the, the uh, technical conditions, okay? So what we aim to do is to take this problem, which is defined only for positive times, right? I'm not talking about uh, beta that are defined in the whole real line, only for beta that are defined in R plus, okay? I want to understand the force dynamic, what happens to the solutions when time goes to plus infinity. And uh, I, I have my model that I gi is given to me now, and uh, I don't know uh, anything about the past. It's the model starts now with a beta t then defined from 
0 to plus infinity. Okay? And what we aim to do is to try to describe what happens to the solution in the future. What is the asymptotic behavior of solutions for this problem? Okay? And why did we choose this problem? We chose this problem because this is, in the autonomous case, when beta is equal to a constant, this is the best understood infinite dimensional dynamical systems which have non-trivial non -trivial dynamics. Okay? All right, so that's the aim, to understand the force dynamic of this model, this very simple model, okay? All right, so let me talk about a, li a little bit before I get into the problem about the inspiration, the autonomous uh, counterpart of that. Let's say, I mean, let's say that we consider this uh, same equation, but now with beta equals to a constant, positive constant. Okay? Lambda is still a positive parameter, beta is a positive constant, and uh, because of the form of this equation, this uh, nonlinearity here is dissipative, all solutions, they are defined for all time, all positive times. Right? So if you start at a given u0, in say h10, right, that uh, the solution of the problem will be defined for all t bigger or equal than zero. So, I start with the initial condition, I evolve it to, to some time t, right? And that evolution gives me a function of x, and that function of x belongs to h10. So I define a map from h10 to h10, which depends on the time t. That's called the solution operator, as beta of t. And that op solution operator has a global attractor. That is, there is a compact set in h10, right? Uh, which is invariant, uh, it's compact, invariant. Uh, that means that if you apply S beta of t to it, you get it exactly the same, you get exactly the same set, right? And uh, this compact set also attracts bounded subsets of H10. So if you take a bounded subset of H10, S beta of t, it takes it uh, asymptotically inside a beta t, a beta, and a beta can be characterized is the set of uh, values at zero of global bounded solutions of this uh, problem. Okay, nice. And uh, the other thing we know about this problem is that is that it is gradient, right? And uh, just so uh, we we set up the ground, let me say that this is the Lyapunov function for it. Right? This is a continuous function from H10 into R, right? and this function uh, along a solution uh, has derivative with respect to time less or equal than zero, so it's decreasing along solution, this is a continuous function decreasing along solution, when, and uh, when it's constant along a solution, this is zero, Right? So you're talking about ut equals zero, that's an equilibrium. Okay? So, and an equilibrium is a solution of this uh, boundary value problem here. Right? It's the right hand side of the equation. I make ut equals zero, and uh, I get uh, this equation here. Okay? So v is indeed a Lyapunov function. So you have a classical gradient system here. Okay. So, in a in, in, in the, the understanding of the dynamics of this problem, the first thing that you notice is that you have equilibria. And the equilibria are the most elementary solutions that you have for your problems. Right? So the equilibria are global solutions. So the equilibria themselves, because of this characterization here, are inside the global attractor. Right? So the equilibria are inside the global attractor. What else is in the global attractor? Well, if you take an equilibrium, you can define its unstable set, right? That's the set of points, U, through which passes a global solution, global solution psi at zero is equal to U, <coughs> that when T goes to minus infinity, converts to the equilibrium, okay? That's the unstable set. Well, but when t goes to minus infinity, the global solution converts to the equilibria, and you have a global attractor. So when t goes to plus infinity, it goes to the global attractor. So that's a bounded solution. So if it's a bounded solution, any element in the unstable set 
must be in the global attractor. So the whole unstable set of each equilibria is contained in the global attractor. So you have this information too. And uh, if you think that uh, uh, you have uh, only finitely many equilibria, we, didn't, we don't know that yet, but I'll, I'll show that that's the case in a little bit. If you think that you have only finitely many equilibria, for a gradient system, you know that whenever you have a global solution, that global solution backwards must come, must converge to an equilibrium, and forwards must converge to another equilibrium. So any global bounded solution must uh, be in the unstable set of some equilibria. Right? Okay. But the attractor is made of values at zero of global bounded solutions. So any element in the global attractor is in the unstable set of some global solution if the number of the equilibrium is finite. Okay. So, uh, in fact, if the number of equilibrium is, is finite, you have that the attractor is equal to the union of the unstable set of the equilibrium. Okay? All right. And let me just say a few words about the, the number of equilibria for this problem when beta is equal to a positive constant. Well, if lambda, lambda is the positive parameter, is between 0 and 1, you have only 0 as an equilibrium. You can prove that. Right? And if lambda is between 1 and 4, you have besides 0, you have two additional equilibrium. One is positive, and the other one is a negative function. It, we have a Dirichlet problem, right? So um, we're, our problem is in H10. So the, the positive equilibrium is zero at the extremes of the interval and positive everywhere else, okay? And the negative equilibrium is minus it. Okay, so you have, in the case lambda is between one and four, you have three equilibria. And uh, if you have lambda between four and nine, you get two additional equilibria besides those. And that, those two additional equilibria, they, they change sign, and they change sign exactly at pi over two. Okay? So they are like this. I'm sorry. They are like this. This is a not very nice picture because uh, it should be completely symmetric. Here you should see the same thing <laughs> here with an ex negative sign as you see here. Right? So, but the, these are the, this is, this is what I call phi 2 plus because it starts positive. And the phi 2 minus is the one that starts negative and becomes positive after pi over 2. Okay? All right. If you go on, if lambda is between n square and n square plus 1, you have two n plus 1 equilibria. Right? And uh, let me name them. That's 0. And the phi j beta plus or minus with j varying from 1 to n. Okay? n is this number here. Okay? And uh, the solution phi j beta, they bifurcate from zero at uh, lambda equal j square. When lambda passes to j square, you get this phi j beta. The phi j beta uh, has j plus one zero, including the two zeros in the extreme, extremes of the interval, right? And the zeros are exactly equally spaced. That's i pi over j for i varying from one to j. They are equally spaced in the interval 0 pi. Okay? The plus is again the solution that starts positive, and the minus is the one that starts negative. Right? So uh, this is the information we have for the equilibrium. That's the work of Schaefer and Fanti. Right? This, uh, this was done in, in, this was published in the, probably in the year 74. It's a volume of the, applicable analysis that's for both years, right? It's the first number of the volume, so this problem is 70, probably in 74 was published, okay? But that's the volume, applicable analysis, and they, they came, up, came up with this uh, nice uh, uh, bifurcation problem that as lambda varies, you get more and more equilibria for this uh, problem when beta is equal to a constant. So. The bottom line is that uh, the number of equilibria is always finite. So you have exactly that structure. The attractor is the union of the unstable set 
of, of the equilibrium. So you started from the equilibrium and you build up the whole attractor. Okay? And you know more. You know that if you start at any point in H10, your solution will converge to one of the two n plus one equilibria right? uh, that you found. Okay? To exactly one. Okay. We don't know which one, but to exactly one. Okay. Okay, in the non-autonomous problem, uh, how this is lost? Because you I have no way to find these nice solutions, which are the equilibria, right? Not at least not uh, making u t equal zero, <laughs> right? But uh, there are uh, other techniques that you can use, and that you, we can actually prove that you have exactly the same sequence of bifurcations for the non-autonomous problem, and you find equilibrium with exactly the same properties that you have for the the uh, equilibria for the no auto for the autonomous case, right? You find solutions which exact with exactly the same problem. This is uh, w a work that I did with uh, Jose Langa and James Robinson. It was published in the Proceeding of Proceedings of the AMS in 2012. Okay, I'll I'll give you some more details on that later, but uh, let me continue with the autonomous case. Okay. If lambda is not the square of a uh, non-negative integer, positive integer, then all the equilibria are hyperbolic. That's also in the original work of Schaefer Infanti. Okay? And uh, the solutions of our equation, or um, a linear version of it, have a very nice property that's called lot number. If you have a solution of our parabolic equation, right, it can be non-autonomous or autonomous, Right? Uh, at each time t, you have a function of x. That function of x has a number of zeros. This number of zeros, they can only decrease with time. It cannot increase with time. Okay, that's called lap number property for the solutions of the one-dimensional uh, heat equation. And this property was proved first by Matano in a work uh, published in the Journal of Faculty of Science of the University of Tokyo in '82. And uh, also, there is some uh, additional uh, information that's given in a paper by Angenen that was published in the Crelli in 1988. Okay? All right. Uh, consequence of this nice property, we know a lot more about the structure of the attractor. Not only that you have 2n plus 1 equilibria, but you know how the connections are. Okay? And and in fact, what you know is that uh, you have this Morse-Mayo property for this uh, uh, infinite dimensional autonomous dynamical systems. And uh, that says that if you have a connection between two equilibria, a global solution that connects two equilibria, then uh, the unstable set of the solution in a min of the equilibria minus infinite and the stable set of the equilibria plus infinite, they intersect transversally. That means that uh, they are uh, manifolds which have a tangent space which complements themselves. They add up to the whole space, right? And uh, uh, that basically says that this structure is robust. It stays under perturbation, right? And with that, uh, Henry in 85, and you can also see that in the work of Fiedler and Russia in the JDE in 1996. Henry was so also published in the JDE in 1985. And they proved that this is the grand diagram of connections. You have to read this diagram in a special manner, so I'll tell you how. Right? Phi zero is, the, is a zero solution. Phi n plus or minus are the solutions with uh, the most number of zeros. The, Right? The, two, the n plus 1 zeros. That's phi n plus and phi n minus. Zero is connected to both. Then this that has uh, n plus 1 zero is connected to the one that has n, uh, n zeros. Right? And also this has, is connected to the one that has n plus 1, n, n zeros. And so on. Right? You can go on with that. But you have to read it in the, in the following manner. If you have a sequence of connections connecting this equilibria to, say, this equilibria, then there is a direct connection. 
And that is a consequence of transversality. Okay, and the long dilemma. Okay? Uh, so, you know a lot about this problem, right? You, you really know how the, the behavior in the global attractor is. You, you know how the solution, solutions are in the global attractor. So, uh, what happens in the non-autonomous case? Right? Uh, with uh, so much structure for the autonomous case, you would expect that you can show something for the non-autonomous case too. Right? And this is in fact the case. If you make a small non-autonomous perturbation of a beta, you say you have a beta constant, you make a small perturbation of it, that is, it's non-constant but it's very close to a constant, then you still have exactly the same structure. Well, that was proved first uh, in 2009 by myself and Jose Langa in the JDE, that the gradient structure remains under the small non-autonomous perturbation. And then uh, this work here is by Jose Langa, myself, uh, Mateus Bortolan, and Genevieve Rugel. It also shows that uh, the, the same uh, connections remain under the small non-autonomous perturbation. Right? <coughs> okay. But what if beta is not close to a constant? <laughs> right? Can you still do something about the dynamics of this problem? And that's uh, what we are working on. Okay? So let me, let me try to explain uh, what we can do with the non-autonomous case when beta is not close to a constant. And uh, to that time, I'll need to, make, uh, I'll need to establish the setup of the problem. Okay? So, uh, this will be a little bit technical, but sorry, it's needed so we understand the, the, uh, what happens to the non-autonomous case. And the goal at the end is to show that much of that structure that we saw for the autonomous case also holds when beta is not close to a constant. Right? Okay. So x for me is going to be the space of continuous functions from z the interval, closed interval 0 infinite into the closed interval beta 1, beta 2. Right? And uh, uh, we consider in this space the metric of uh, the uniform conversions in compact subsets of zero infinite. Okay? With that metric, I consider beta. Beta now is dependent of time. Right? And I consider all the forward translation. I take a positive number s, and I, I, my variable is here, is this dot. After s, Right? You have a function defined in R plus taking value into beta 1, beta 2. Right? That's the forward translations of beta. It's an element of x for each s that you give. Right? So it's like the orbit of this when you take the translations. You take your beta, truncate at s, and move it back to 0. Okay? That gives you another function in x. and, and Besides that, you close it with respect to the metric of uniform convergence in compact subsets of uh, zero infinity. Okay, now this is my H, it's H for who, right? In English, which means uh, that uh, means who is not really appropriate here because we use it, use it for for uh, convex who and things like that. But it's in this sense. Right? It's, it's called who. Uh, and uh, in, in H you define this theta t. The theta t is the forward translation of an element of H by time t. An element of H is an element of x, which is a function defined in zero infinite. It takes in value in beta 1, beta 2, say gamma. Right? And Theta t of gamma is the forward translation by time t. You go to the time t, cut it, and move it back to zero. Okay? Okay. So the family of maps, theta t, is what we call driving semigroups. For each t, you have a map, right? That takes h into h. Right? That's called driving semigroup. Of course, if beta is constant, h is trivial, it's just the beta, and theta is just the identity, right? So you have H just, a, just a point and theta being the identity when you are in the autonomous case. All right. Okay, now, uh, if you take any gamma in H, you can 
take your same problem with beta, replace beta by gamma. Right? That's still a function from zero infinity into beta one, beta two. Okay. And that's the I'm taking the initial value at zero, initial time at zero, right? And uh, still the initial boundary conditions. Okay? Okay, that uh, for each u zero in H10, I have the solution of this problem at time t, and that's what I call k of t gamma u zero gamma because I'm using gamma here. And, and u0 here is in h10, this, the solution of this problem at time t is a function of h10, so um, it's a map from h10 into h10. And that map has a very nice property that uh, uh, it's a continuous uh, function from h10 into h10 and has these properties here. That at zero is identity, of course, if you don't move, you know, it's still at the same point. The function that takes t u gamma into k of t gamma u from r plus cross h10 cross h into h10 is a continuous function. Depends continuously with respect to time, with respect to the initial condition, and with respect to the gamma. You vary a little bit. The gamma the solution varies only a little bit. Okay? And it has this third nice property that's called the cocycle property. That says that if I take a u0 and I evolve it forwards using the gamma in the nonlinearity by time s, then I take that result and I evolve it forwards additional time t's, but not using the gamma, using theta s of gamma, translating gamma forwards by s, then it's the same as evolving directly from gamma t by split t plus s quantities. That's the usual property of a differential equation, and it's translated here as the cocycle property. Okay? When you are in the autonomous case, uh, you can call S beta of t to k, this operator k, at t beta. Beta is now, if you are in the autonomous, the only function that you are, that's in h. Right? So you call S beta of t. And if you use the cocycle property, k of t plus s, which is s beta of t plus s, is equal to k of t theta s of beta plus k of s beta. But beta is constant, so theta s of beta is equal to beta. So that's t of t, sorry, s beta of t, and this is s beta of s. So that composition, s beta of t with s beta of s, is s beta of t plus s. So that's a semigroup, right? just as before. All right. Uh, OK. With that, I can define what's called the skew product semiflow. The references here are the work by George Sell in the transactions in 1967, and the work by uh, the book by Sell and Yu was published by Springer in 2002. And uh, the skew product semigroup is defined in this way. You take U belonging to your phase space, in our case H10, and gamma belonging to this script H, the who, right? And pi t at u gamma is, I take gamma and evolve it forward by t using the driving semigroup. And I take u and evolve it forward using k of t gamma, which corresponds to our equation with the nonlinearity with gamma, evolve it forward by time t. Okay, with that, this is a semigroup. This has the semigroup property. T, pi of t plus s is pi of t composed with pi of s. That's the semigroup property. And it's very easy to check using the cocycle property. It's highlighted there how to do it, or skip it. Okay, so the important thing is that this is a semigroup. Right? So now I started with my no autonomous problem and I came back to the semigroup which is the autonomous set. Okay? All right. So it, from this, it becomes clear that to understand the forward dynamics, we need to understand the forward dynamics of the driving semigroup. What happens to the, our nonlinearities? They are vector fields. They are defined, they are different ones for each time. What happens to those when time goes to plus infinity? Because the vector fields are the things that drive the solution. So not only what happens to the solutions, 
is important, but what happens to the uh, vector fields as time evolves is important. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we must take into account what happens to the forward dynamics of our driving semigroup. Okay. In the autonomous case, of course, if you take the uh, skew product semigroup, that is defined like this, but uh, I mean, this here, the evolution of uh, by time t of beta is beta itself, and this is the semigroup. So it's just taking the semigroup and putting a second coordinate, which is constant and equals to beta, beta constant. Okay? So that's the autonomous setup. So everything is now in the setup of skew product semigroup. Okay? Okay. Now, to uh, understand the dynamics of the skew product semigroup, I need to uh, understand the relationship between the different notions of attractors. So, that's what I'm going to do in this uh, uh, part of the lecture, to establish the relationship between the different notions of attractors for non-autonomous problems. Okay, so, but the first, uh, uh, first of all, I need to note the following. If you if you have a, a gamma, which is in the global attractor of the driving semigroup, so it's a function in this script H, right? But it's in the global attractor of the driving semigroup. So through that function passes a global solution of the driving semigroup because this is an invariant set. So you have a global bounded solution through that function. I'm calling that global solution V. Global solution is a function that satisfies this property, right? You apply the semigroup to V of S, and that gives you V of T plus S, and that holds for every S in R, and for every T bigger or equal than zero. Okay, and it passes through gamma at zero. If you have that, then you can associate an evolution process to this, to this global solution. And that evolution process is given by this equation here. That's, uh, instead of writing here gamma, I write V of S, T minus S. But what, was that, what does that have to do with gamma? Well, if you think that S is positive, V of S is just V at zero and theta S applied to V of zero. Theta S applied to V of zero is the translation forward by S. But if I, if I have the translation forward by S and I'm computing this at T minus S, I get T. And V at zero is gamma, so I get gamma of T. Right? So that's a natural way to extend this function gamma, which is defined only for positive times, for negative times. Now S is uh, any number in the real line. So you, and T is any number in the real line. The only thing that I need is that T is bigger or equal than S, so that this difference here is positive. Okay? So it's a natural way, and it's given by the flow. It's not something artificial. This extension is given by the flow. Okay? Now, if I have this defined in the whole real line for all t and s, with t bigger or equal than s, s being any number in the real line, then I can associate to this an evolution process. I, that's uh, instead of evolving from 0 to t, I evolve from s to t for any s in the real line and for any t bigger or equal than s. Right? That evolution process is given by this. This is the cocycle at t minus s with the nonlinearity v of s. Okay, that's defined for all t bigger or equal than s and now, and now s in r. All right. So with this evolution process that takes the states at time s to the states at time t, t bigger or equal than s, right? That's it's an evolution process in the sense that if you take t bigger or equal than tau and tau bigger or equal than s and make this composition here, that's the same as going directly from s to t. Right? That's an evolution process. And with this evolution, I can relate the skew product attractor, the attractor for the skew product semigroup, with the pullback attractors of this evolution process. Okay? So, if you have a uh, that the uh, skew product uh, semigroup is associated to our original equation, uh, no autonomous equation with uh, beta, and then that uh, skew product semigroup has a global attractor. We can prove that. And uh, 
as a consequence of that, the second coordinate is independent of the first. The second coordinate has a global attractor. So theta t is a semigroup with a global attractor. Let me call it script s. Okay. If you take a global solution in the global attractor of the driving semigroup, then you can define the evolution process as I did before, I just, as I just did. Right? That evolution process has a pullback attractor. The pullback attractor is just a, a family of sets, a v of t, t belonging to the real line, such that uh, uh, it's invariant. And the notion of invariance now means that uh, you take s of t v of uh, t tau and apply to a v of tau. That gives me exactly a v at t. That's the invariance. And the pullback attracts bounded set. That means that if you take a bounded set, apply t of t tau to it, right, and make tau go to minus infinity, not t go to plus infinity, tau go to minus infinity, that asymptotically enters a v of t. Okay, that gets inside a v of t. That's a pullback attractor, right? Okay, but then for each v, I have a, a, a pullback attractor. And the attractor for the skew product semiflow is given by this union. It's just a pullback attractor. In the second coordinate, I put this function here. That's v of t. That's an element of h, right? In fact, an element of s, right? Which is a subset of h. I take this, this, and I make the union for all t and r, and then I make the union for all possible v's in the drive in, in the global attractor of the driving semigroups, Glo global solutions of the driving semigroup in, in taking value in the global attractor of the driving semigroup. Okay? That's exactly the uh, attractor for the skew product semiflow. Okay. What we show is that uh, the, 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 the attractor for the skew product semiflow, semigroup, uh, has a structure which is similar to the structure of the autonomous problem that I explained in the beginning of the lecture. Okay? And to show that, I need to introduce some more notions, and that's the notion of dynamically gradient semigroups. I'll go very fast through that. Uh, first, I need the, uh, the notion of uh, isolated invariant sets, which is given in this definition. So let's say that you have a matrix space M. M could be either uh, H10 cross H or H or H10. M, M is just a metric space, right? And S is a semigroup in M. Okay? And uh, suppose that it has a global attractor. We say that uh, E is an isolated invariant set if it's the maximal invariant set in a neighborhood of itself. We have the set, make, is, take a small neighborhood of it. That's the maximal invariant set inside that neighborhood. Okay, that's an isolated invariant set. And we say that a family E1 up to En of subsets of M is a disjoint collection of isolated invariant sets if each of them is isolated invariant set, and they're disjoint. They are two, two are separated. They are separated from one another. Okay? Okay. Now, with this, the isolated invariant sets, they are interesting because they have this uh, topological hyperbolicid property. If you stay in a neighborhood of an isolated invariant set for all time after a given time, if your solution stays there for all time after a given time, it must converge there. Or for, if it stays there for all time before a given time, then backwards it must converge there too. Okay? So it's, this is kind of a, a hyperbolicid property for the uh, isolated invariant properties, uh, sets. Okay. And then I need also the notion of homoclinic structure. And uh, let's say that we have a semigroup with a global attractor, A, and uh, a collect disjoint collection of isolated invariant sets in A. A homoclinic structure is just a subset of this collection, right? Together with the global solutions, connecting them, the subset connecting them uh, one from minus infinity to plus infinity. And such that it makes a loop at the end. So here a picture is useful. You have the isolated invariant sets, and you have the global solutions connecting them, and minus from minus infinity to plus infinity, 
and they make a loop. They loop back to the first one. Okay, that's a homoclinic structure. Okay, this is in, each of this is invariant, right? You have no solutions directly from here to here. You, you may not have any solution directly from here to here, but you have this cycle made by finitely many solutions and finitely many isolated invariant sets. Okay, in the case we have only one, you have to leave the invariant set and go back to itself. Okay, so that you call it a homoclinic structure. Okay, but if you have more than one, this is not needed. Okay, so here's the notion of dynamically gradient semigroup. A dynamically gradient semigroup is a semigroup with a global attractor that uh, has a disjoint collection of isolated invariant sets and such that any global solution that you take comes from an isolated invariant set and goes to an isolated invariant set. It connects two of them. Okay? And you have no cycles like that. So remember that for gradient semigroups, you cannot have cycles because you have an energy that decays and the energy is only constant uh, when you are at the uh, equilibria, right? So you cannot loop, have a sequence of connections looping back to the first equilibrium because everything will be equilibrium, right? So we're just mimicking this, the, the conditions that you have for the gradient uh, semigroups, okay? So that's a dynamically gradient semigroup. The isolated invariant sets play the role of equilibrium, okay? And uh, in this last minute, let me say that uh, this is the structure that we have for the uh, um, for the attractor of the uh, skew product semigroup. Okay, we have a finite uh, collection of isolated invariant sets and connections among them for the skew product semigroup of our original equation. Okay, let me describe that a little bit. Okay, of course, if you have a, a, a dynamically gradient semigroup. Our solutions come from an isolated invariant set and go to another. So the attract is the union of the unstable set of the isolated invariant sets. Right? That's the same structure we saw before. And more, you have no loops. Right? Okay. Okay, so this is what we proved that the skew product semigroup associated to our original PDE is uh, dynamically gradient. So what, we do, what I do next is to identify uh, which, which are the isolated invariant sets. How, how are the isolated invariant sets? In the autonomous case, they were the equilibrium. What are they now? Right. Okay. Okay, so if you take any global solution uh, in the global attractor of the driving semigroup, right? and you take lambda between n square and n plus 1 square, that's the situation that in the autonomous case would lead to two, two n plus 1 equilibria. Right? Uh, you have two n no autonomous equilibria, we call them no autonomous equilibria. Right? They are global bounded solutions which uh, do not come from zero and do not go to zero, they are away from zero in some sense. Okay? Okay, you have this two n no autonomous equilibrium, and uh, I index them in V because they depend on the global solution. For each global solution, you have this two n, which global solution, which correspond to uh, a gamma of t, which is defined in the whole real line. Right? For each global solution, you have two uh, n no autonomous equilibrium. They change when you change the global solution. Okay? For the driving semi-group. Okay. And uh, we proved that uh, if you take u0 in H10 and tau in R, any, right, is starting with your uh, s solution of uh, our original problem, our original uh, parabolic equation, right, the solution must converge when t goes to plus infinity to this set here. So in the autonomous case, we had that the solution would converge to one of the equilibria. Here, the solution will converge to this set here. What is this set? This set is, well, you take your non-autonomous equilibria associated to your global solution of the driving semigroup, compute that at zero, right? And you take every, 
every possibility of V varying the global attractor of the driving semigroup. Okay, so instead of one point, you have a set there, right, which is indexed in the, this function V, which is the global solution for the driving semigroup. And those sets are the sets to which the solutions converge. Okay? Uh, we also proved that if you have a, a global bounded solution for our equation with uh, five here is, is our equation with uh, v, of, I mean, v of s computed at, the, at t minus s instead of gamma. Okay? So if you take uh, any global solution for that, then when t goes to minus infinity, that global solution must converge also to one of these sets. Okay? Or, I mean, it's either to zero or to one of these sets. Okay? I forgot to say that zero is, should be there too, right? You have this 2n equilibrium, but you also have the zero. Zero is always an equilibrium. Right? Okay. So, uh, We also know that uh, from zero, you have solutions that go to any of these isolated invariant sets. To each of these, right? So from zero, you have connections to each of the isolated invariant sets, which we had also in the autonomous case, right? And uh, we can establish that uh, any global solution it must come from the one isolated invariant set and converge to another isolated invariant set. Okay? As we can also prove. Okay? And for the skew product semiflow, the isolated invariant sets are this E0 is the just zero, but here you put the value at zero of the V for any V global solution of the driving semigroup. So in the second coordinate, you have the whole S. This, this, this is actually zero comma S, the global attractor of the driving semigroup, right? Okay, and for the others, you have this uh, at zero, the no autonomous equilibria associated to V at zero plus or minus. And you have V at zero here. And V is varying for all global solutions taking value in the global attractor of the driving semigroup. Okay. And let me say a little bit more about this uh, global uh, bounded solutions, which we call the no autonomous equilibria. They are, um, they have very nice properties. They, if you take the J, with plus or minus. Plus is because it starts positive and minus is because it starts negative. Uh, for, this is a function of x, right? For each time it starts positive with x, the plus, and for, the, for, for each time it starts negative with the minus. Okay. It vanishes as a function of x exactly at i pi over j for i varying from 0 to j, just like the equilibrium. Okay. And it has these nice symmetry properties. The plus is positive in the first interval between 0 and pi over j. And uh, uh, it has this symmetry property, which is just saying that uh, I can switch this around and still have the same function. Right? It starts positive. If I switch this like this, it still uh, is the same function. Okay, the negative starts negative, and you have the same property. Okay, and for j bigger or equal than two, in the next interval, it switch sign. It's this, but switching sign. Okay, right. So, and and that goes on, right? So it goes switching sign and repeating this profile, positive or negative, until you complete the interval zero pi. Okay? Okay. And uh, we can also assure that you don't have this homoclinic structure, and that we do using the lap number property of uh, solutions. Okay. Uh, in fact, 
uh, we can prove that uh, this uh, non-autonomous equilibrium for each time is a function of x. That function of x lies between two equilibria. Say, if I'm considering j equals 2 and the plus, the equilibrium have this form here. They're completely symmetric like this and like this switching sign, right? Uh, and the non-autonomous equilibrium lies in here for each time. So as time evolves, this may change a little bit inside here, but it stays between these two and uh, has the same symmetry properties. Okay? So with that we conclude that uh, our uh, skew product semigroup is dynamically gradient, has some of the very nice properties that our autonomous counterpart has. All right. Uh, okay. Let me just give you one idea on how you can obtain that there is at least one of this uh, uh, no autonomous equilibrium. If you look at this region here, right, the, the functions that take the, the functions whose graph are between these two blue graphs, and if you consider the symmetry properties that I mentioned, you can switch the function here and you get the same, or can switch the function the whole interval and change sign, you get the same. That's an invariant region in H10 for your semigroup. Being invariant, you have a, uh, for your, sorry, for your evolution process. Being invariant, you have a pullback attractor. Having a pullback attractor, you have global solutions, and those are the ones that we are looking at. Okay? Uh, then you have to prove that there is only one. And that's the difficult part, right? Uh, but uh, uh, you can prove also that there is only one for each V that you give in this uh, space with this symmetry. Okay? So my time is almost up. I don't have time to uh, tell you the, the techniques, but l let me just mention some very important works because it's not very good to no, not to give credit to people, right? So uh, for the for obtaining this uh, non-autonomous equilibria, we use the work of uh, Aníbal Rodríguez Vernal and uh, Alejandro Vidal López that was published in the Discrete and Continuous Dynamical Systems in 2007. And uh, they, they do a very nice work with the positive equilibria, and we are, were able to extend that to all the, all the equilibria, which change sign, uh, use, if choosing proper subspaces of H10 to work on. And that's in the work of myself, uh, Jose Langa, and James Robinson, the proceedings of the AMS in 2002. Okay, and uh, to obtain the, that uh, the omega limit and the alpha limit sets are in this isolated invariant set, we use the work of uh, Chen and Matano, which was published in the JDE in, in, in 1989, right? Uh, and w which says that the omega limit has, some, has the nice uh, symmetry properties that we have for the uh, equilibrium. These nice symmetries are pre present in the omega limits of problem, even in the non-autonomous case. We adapt that to obtain the alpha limit, and we are able to show that indeed it converts to the isolated invariant sets in this work that we did uh, with uh, Jose and uh, Eta Brosche. Okay, so with that I just leave you with the conjectures that we still have to work on on this. And the conjectures are when all this uh, non-autonomous equilibrium, they should be hyperbolic. Just like the equilibria, if you have that uh, your parameter is not uh, uh, positive integer square. Right? It should all be uh, hyperbolic. Indeed, we have evidence at least in the discretized case of this, that uh, hyperbolicity holds. Okay? And we also cannot characterize exactly what is the pullback attractor for each V in the global attractor of the driving semigroup, and, but we believe that this pullback attractor is the union of the unstable set of the non-autonomous equilibrium. Right? And, uh, 
Okay. And uh, we also claim that you have connections be between the non-autonomous equilibria, just like in the autonomous case. That, fa that di diagram of connections is the same in this case. Okay? But all this is conjecture for now. Okay? Okay. Okay, that's it. I th thank you very much for your attention. Vosotros. Is this equation which I feel inclined to equation somehow related or motivated, related with or motivated by oscillatory problems, so oscillation, uh, oscillatory mechanics or phenomena? Because you get the, the equilibrium, they look like standing waves. You have also this heteroclinical uh, change, you have also this, uh, well, the stationary. Solutions you show they, they look periodic, right? Somehow related to the, the equation, of course, now because you don't have this uh, wave equation, but uh, the solution they do. And also, this uh, u, the term u, u to the cube, like in Duffin, uh, oscillator. It, uh, so it's somehow, somehow it's related. I, I don't know. I can say because the equation looks uh, slightly different, but uh, the solutions they look very similar. Well, yeah. Uh, what I can say is that uh, this is very artificially chosen, yeah, so right. that we have the nice properties needed to show yeah, uh, right. how the my, my guess, uh, how the, the the things that we see in the autonomous case, right? Of course, you don't have to choose u cube. You can choose some other odd. Uh, term there and, uh, with a negative feedback, but uh, but the non-autonomous is related to some oscillation problem with oscillations or something. Or not mm, I don't think so actually, because beta is I mean beta is only a globally Lipschitz function. So it's in your case, yeah. But in the original one is constant. No, the original ones are constant. That I wouldn't know how to. Was uh, motivated by any? In not sure if they say anything in the paper. It's right. just a, let's say, uh, was a ad hoc problem. Just uh, nice for, that you do handle. You yeah. can handle it, but uh, it's not related to any. We are not, I mean, as I said in the beginning, we are in this quest to understand the dynamics of no autonomous problems. And uh, we picked this example for no particular reason in application, just because we know very much the structure of the autonomous case. Right? So everything is quite artificial in this sense, but uh, it's, you have to start from examples. And we wanted to have an example for which you uh, really know what's happening to the dynamics to the, of the non-autonomous case, so you can motivate people to dig in and find other interesting uh, models where you can describe the properties of the asymptotics of the non-autonomous problems. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.